scintillating presentation is about AES and export compliance. are going to learn so much today and have so much fun doing it. <laughs> you heard him, sound the bell! Hour ready to go! But first we must jump on the Wayback Machine for our first adventure. Look at this. This is a form out of the archives here that we used at one time, the Shippers Export Declaration. What's that, Ryan? One time we had to use that uh, in our profession, uh, but no longer. It was abolished uh, geez, 12 years ago. I can't believe. Uh, the, it was called the Shippers Export Declaration. And that morphed into the EEI, which is referred to, which is short for the Electronic Export Information. That's the information that we enter into AES. Uh, it's used by the Census Bureau to compile the statistics on international trade. I don't know if you, you uh, listen to the news, but when uh, the reports come, about, come out about the uh, trade deficit or balance of trade with the United States and other countries, that's how this information is compiled, out of AES. Also used by uh, the BIS, the Commerce Department, uh, State Department, Customs, and Immigration and Customs Enforcement for Export Control. Provides uh, proof of export to U.S. Customs for processing refunds and drawback claims. Also used to detect potential threats to the security of our country and to detect money laundering. Used to analyze the impact of existing and proposed trade agreements with other countries. So it's, uh, it's important information. It's used for a lot of different purposes. Uh, background and history of AES, uh, some of you may not be aware, was created originally to make collection of trade data more efficient and accurate. Now, when we were required to use that uh, yellow form, uh, I mean, the accuracy of the information on that uh, was a lot of times suspect. Uh, and even one of my former managers in this company uh, told me more than once that if we did not know the Schedule B number, we didn't, we didn't get it from the, from the shipper, or we couldn't get it, uh, we, were, we could just put down our phone number. And at that time, it was, uh, the Schedule B number was seven digits. But uh, we don't do that anymore. Don't let me, uh, maybe I should have mentioned that because that'll give you some ideas. <laughs> Bad ideas. Uh, okay, promotes information sharing among uh, multiple government agencies. First implemented way back in July of 1995. And our fine company became certified to use uh, AES in March of 2000. Uh, per the regulations, the EEI is a statement to the United States government that the transaction occurred as described. The filer is responsible for the truth, accuracy, and completeness of the EEI. The EEI is an export control document. And all information in the EI must be true, accurate, and complete. Now, this picture here uh, reminds me of a, a story I will tell you uh, that happened to one of our offices uh, in uh, Chicago, the, uh, the Ocean uh, branch. Uh, this is a uh, composite here, a little screen capture of the, of the filing that they did in AES for a shipment of toothbrushes that they sent out. And uh, that shipment drew the attention of the Census Bureau. Somebody called about that uh, entry in AES and was questioning the accuracy of the filing. Specifically, they wanted to know if there were only two toothbrushes in that shipment worth $6,458. 
And you can understand why they might have thought that because they put quantity at two and the total value was $12,917. So the, the moral of this story uh, is that there are people that notice what you put in there. You just don't throw garbage in there and hope that nobody notices because somebody does notice. The Census Bureau does audits. You may have uh, received an inquiry uh, from the Census Bureau yourself asking you to validate the information that was entered for a certain shipment because they, uh, they want to make sure that what is in there is accurate. Uh, okay, finally, the uh, information entered in uh, AES is based on uh, the no personal knowledge of facts stated or you know, information furnished by the parties to the export transaction. Now, who are the parties to the export transaction? Uh, there are three of them. Uh, now, uh, these are uh, terms that the uh, federal government made up for ones that we are most familiar with. You know, uh, I don't know why they couldn't just use shipper, consignee, exporter, importer, uh, seller, buyer. That was too simple. They thought it would be uh, more challenging, more interesting if they uh, created new terms to try to confuse us. And uh, they succeeded in that objective. Uh, these are the terms that they created. And you, uh, you may have heard these. I hope you have heard these uh, by now in, uh, in your jobs uh, since you've been doing them with our company. Uh, U.S. principal party and interest is the shipper, the exporter. Foreign principal party and interest is the consignee or the importer, and the authorized agent is the freight forwarder, us. Uh, the U.S. principal party and interest, uh, more commonly referred to as the USPPI, is defined in the regulation as the person or legal entity in the United States that receives the primary benefit, monetary or otherwise, from the export transaction. Now, uh, who can this be, you may ask? Well, uh, for instance, some of you may be familiar with uh, one of our customers, uh, Honeywell. From time to time, we handle business for them. And I, I believe, I may, uh, I may be mistaken here, but almost all of the business that we handle for them is uh, routed by uh, constantly. Uh, you see a huge company, uh, about 1,300 sites. Uh, they're into uh, aerospace, building technologies, uh, performance materials, over 130,000 employees. Their stock has done quite well. I have to always update these, uh, this uh, graph here, this chart for every presentation I do to make sure that it's up to the date. And I, I did, I got this. Uh, today. Okay, so I'm giving you accurate information. Uh, as you see here, their stock has done quite well over the past uh, 10 years. You may want to consider uh, putting this one in your portfolio. Okay. Uh, no charge for that stock tip. It's, it's all gratis, you know, considered a door prize for coming today. Well, anyway, uh, from time to time, we handle uh, business from Honeywell uh, going to ST Aerospace. Now, I know uh, Chicago, you're familiar with that uh, business, uh, Los Angeles, and uh, Atlanta, you know SD Aerospace, and I think from time to time there's a shipment that comes out of uh, Austin area for uh, SD Aerospace. And that is routed business, routed by SD Aerospace, and almost everything uh, that is sent to them is licensed. Well, in this, for this particular shipment uh, being handled by JFK, uh, Honeywell was disputing our position that we were supposed to report them in AES as the US PPI. Instead, they were saying because the, the business is routed and we obtained the license on behalf of ST Aerospace, we, Kintetsu, should be reported in AES as the US PPI. Well, so we had a little discussion here, and uh, I tried to explain to uh, this person at Honeywell that uh, we are not the exporter of record, and we are not the principal party in interest. 
because uh, we do not conform to the definition of those terms. So eventually she consulted with someone in her Washington, D.C. office and uh, ultimately uh, agreed with us that uh, routed transactions can be complex and that we could indeed report Honeywell as the US PPI and AEF. So hallelujah on that one. <laughs> uh, now, one thing I want you to uh, remember from this uh, session today, if you don't remember anything else, that exporter of record does not exist. A lot of people use that term. I can assure you, nowhere in the regulations will you see it. So I'm going to do my Nancy Pelosi imitation. <laughs> <laughs> Does not exist. Okay. Get it out of your head. <clears throat> A lot of people think it does exist because on the import side, we have importer of record. So logically, we must think, well, we have importer of record. We must have an exporter of record. Uh, well, that's not the case. I'm sorry. It's, uh, regulations sometimes are not that logical. Uh, instead, what we do have in the regulations is something that's called an exporter. Not an exporter record, but an exporter. And what is an exporter? Well, it's simply put, it's just an applicant for a license. Uh, a lot of times you'll, uh, you will encounter uh, customers that will tell you that uh, they, the shipper, they are not the, sh uh, the US PPI. You are, because the business is routed. So, uh, Let's take a look at this. Is this possible that Kintetsu can be the US PPI? Well, here's the definition of uh, US PPI in the regulations. You, can be, you have to be a seller, a manufacturer, an order party, or a foreign entity in the United States when the items are purchased. So uh, Kintetsu is not selling the material that we are exporting, and we are not manufacturing the material. Uh, we're not ordering it, and we're not a foreign party that is purchasing, purchasing it. So therefore, we cannot be the US PPI in these circumstances. Uh, I will say Kintetsu almost never is US PPI. So there are some times when we can be. But it's a mighty big if when we can be. And when we can be are these two circumstances when we are declared as the importer of record on an entry form, and we are acting as the customs broker for a foreign importer and clearing goods through customs and then re-exporting them. Uh, or the importer of record is a foreign entity and we are acting as the customs broker to clear that shipment through US Customs and then re-export it. Those are the two cases, only two cases, where Kintetsu can be a US PPI and AES. The FPPI, I think most people understand this, is a foreign party uh, who purchases the material to be exported or to whom final delivery or end use of the goods will be made. And the authorized agent is the government's term for the freight forward. That's us. And we are responsible for obtaining a POA or a written authorization form from the US PPI or the FPPI. Now, how do we know which entity uh, is to provide us with the uh, POA or the uh, written authorization? Well, really, it's, it's pretty simple. You just need to listen what you are being told. It's that simple. And you need to understand from where you are receiving instruction to handle that shipment. Your mission, your objective, your assignment, simply put, it's not hard. It's not difficult. People want to make it hard, but it's not. There is somebody somewhere in the world either in the United States or in a foreign country, 
who is saying, I want to use Kintetsu. I want Kintetsu to handle this business. Who is this? Who is this person who's, who's saying to you, Kintetsu, I want you to handle this business? So if it's the USPPI, then you're supposed to get a POA, a written authorization form from the USPPI. If it's the FPPI, you're supposed to get the POA, a written authorization from the FPPI. And when the FPPI is routing the business, nominating Kintetsu, nominating the forwarder to handle the business, that shipment is referred to as a routed export transaction in the regulations. Now, here is a uh, email that we got. Uh, let me see, actually, this came into uh, uh, our Dallas office, or Houston was handling some business, uh, going to Brazil. And I got this email from uh, Keiko Masasaki in Dallas uh, asking me how we should respond to a message that uh, they got from one of their customers. And the message was this. They were saying, uh, we need you, Kintetsu, this is the shipper talking here, uh, Ascend Performance Materials. The shipper is saying to our Houston office, we want you to provide us with a copy of the POA or the written authorization form that you received from the consignee. In this case, it was Ecolab Brazil. And why did they want us to do that? Because it was Ecolab Brazil that nominated Contetsu to handle the business. And the reason why they want this is because we need it on file in our records to be sure the FPPP, FPPI has given authorization for the export filing of this routed export. So, would you know what to say to that customer? Well, this is what I uh, told Keiko to say. Uh, what, I told her what she needed to do. I said, you need to get a copy of this uh, written authorization of the POA from Ecolab Brazil. If you can't produce a copy uh, of it and send it to the shipper, they're not going to let you handle the business. And you may ask, well, can they do that? Is that legal? Yeah, they can do it because the regulations say they can do that. It says right here, upon request, the authorized agent will provide a copy of the POA or written authorization to the US PPI issued by the FPPI. So this, this does happen, and you got to be ready to respond to it. You got to be uh, ready to do your job and get that required authorization from the consignee. Now, this is a uh, screen capture of the SOI, which I think most of you are uh, familiar with. And I want you to understand, too, that uh, the SLI is a valid type of written authorization. However, it is uh, valid only per shipment. It is not a blanket authorization for, for all shipments that we handle for a uh, shipper, USPPI. Uh, and because a SLI is a valid type of authorization, a USPPI may refuse to give it to you if you are handling a routed export transaction, a business that's routed by the consignee, because there's only one party who's supposed to give you authorization to handle their business. It's either the shipper or the consignee, the USPPI or the FPPI. It can't be two people. All right, now this was uh, a screen capture of the, uh, the written authorization that Houston ultimately did get from the consignee Ecolab Brazil, and they reported it correctly in AES as a routed export transaction. So everybody walked away happy with that one, and they ended up, that was a pretty big size shipment, two tons, and uh, they charged out 315 a kilo. So see, if, uh, if they couldn't produce the POA, a written authorization, they wouldn't be able to handle the shipment. Now, be aware of a uh, resource that is uh, uh, published by the National Customs Brokers and Forwarders Association of America. And we also have this uh, posted on our uh, intranet, on the Export Compliance Program. 
This is a uh, USPPI re responsibility information sheet, and it's a uh, brief summary of the regulations, uh, export regulations that apply to handling uh, export transactions and routed export transactions. Uh, be aware that this is out there and you can use it, you can uh, send it to customers that may be unfamiliar with the regulations, use it yourself to, to as, a, uh, as a reference tool for understanding the regulations and maybe uh, consider giving it to other people in your office who may need to uh, understand uh, the important regulations that apply to their jobs. Uh, this is uh, an example of a POA that we got from one of our customers. Ideally, we like to have the EIN displayed on the POA. That way it uniquely identifies that uh, entity that is providing us with the POA. And we want to make sure that these things are filled out correctly. Now, in this case, uh, this one was not. It should have been uh, Atlantic Lab equipment down here. So we had to reject this one. So a lot of times, you know, these uh, customers don't know how to fill these out. So you got to make sure uh, they know what they're doing here. And uh, corporate officer must sign a POA. Uh, any employee of the uh, uh, USPPI or FPPI can provide you with written authorization. And again, uh, just want to make sure that <laughs> these are filled out correctly because uh, sometimes they're not. And, um, well, this, uh, this one here kind of prompted me to reformat the written authorization <laughs> to make sure that it wasn't uh, misinterpreted. Uh, what I was looking for here was the, uh, the, the job title or position of the person who is <laughs> signing the uh, document, uh, not, uh, not something else there. Maybe that was their, their shipment plate or, or something else. Uh, okay, let's take another uh, step into the Wayback Machine here. Uh, once upon a time, uh, years ago, in our business, we had uh, this document called uh, a routing instruction, or sometimes it was called a routing order. Here's a couple of examples of it passing around. <clears throat> now, what did we do with this? Well, uh, we had to get on our Kintetsu hat. And then we went to the customer. This was the, the foreign customer. Uh, and uh, they would issue that routing instruction and say, I want Kintetsu to handle my business. And we would say, marvelous. And we'd do a jig. And then that uh, routing instruction would be sent back to the United States by carrier pigeon. We get it here in the United States, and then we then would deliver that form to the shipper and say, look, Mr. Shipper, our mutual customer wants to use us, wants to use Kintetsu for the business that you send to them. Will you honor their request? And uh, in most cases, they would. Sometimes they wouldn't, but I would say in most cases, they did. So uh, why, uh, why am I bringing this up? Well, you may, you may ask. Well, it's relevant for our discussion here about POAs and written authorizations. I want you to think of the POA or the written authorization as a, t as a type of government mandated routing order. The government needs to see a chain of command, a line of authority in the export transaction. Simply put, which party is directing the export? That's, that's all they want to see. And the, and, the, and the POA and the written authorization serves as evidence as to who is directing the shipment. It's that simple. Uh, now, if there is no filing and AES required, uh, the POA or written authorization is not required. So understand that point. Now, whenever you get these, you can send them in to... Uh, us by email, soft copy is fine, send it to any of those uh, email addresses that you see there. And uh, we post these on our internet. Uh, so if you wanna see if we have one, this is the place to go. 
Uh, now, valid IDs for US PPI. Uh, it's, it should be a uh, EIN number, which is, stands for Employer Identification Number, uh, sometimes referred to as Tax ID Number or Federal uh, Tax ID Number. But the uh, actual name of it is, is an EIN. Think of it as a uh, Social Security Number for a corporation. Uh, it's either nine or 11 characters. Uh, and the other acceptable ID for a US PPI and AES is a passport number. Now that can only be used for a foreign citizen who came to the United States to purchase something that ultimately is exported. Uh, it can't be used for an individual person who is a citizen of the United States. Uh, what the regulations say is that, uh, okay, we say this Dunn's number, there's, uh, there's a Dunn's number, but uh, we don't like to use that because they have to use that in conjunction with a uh, EIN. Okay, Social Security number. A lot of people who, who uh, would export individually uh, think that they would uh, just provide us with their Social Security number. Uh, well, that used to be true at one point, but no longer. Effective uh, December of 2009, uh, an individual person who wants to export something from the United States uh, would have to apply for an EIN. Uh, I mean, it may sound kind of crazy, but that's what the regulations say. So uh, you can't use a social security number because that's a violation of the uh, Privacy Act, I would think of uh, 1974. All right, you see there, those are only three acceptable IDs for a US PPI, AES. And those, that's what we have in uh, UFS also. All right, now here we have a, uh, a, a, compound, a section of a letter here that we got from uh, the Internal Revenue Service. Uh, actually, it was Sky Beko, company, one of our customers, Sky Beko in Canada. They obtained an EIN from the Internal Revenue Service. But note that they are a Canadian company. So, I mean, it looks legit. Uh, so, the question came up. Can we report Skybeco in AES as a US PPI? They got an EIN. So, I ask you, can we do it? <laughs> I guess we don't. <laughs> okay, well, why, why, why would we? Because it's a foreign entity. You have, look at the definition of US PPI, personal legal entity in the United States. So if you're in a foreign country, you can't be a US PPI because that's contrary to the definition of a US PPI. If this is uh, section and ace here, where you report the US PPI, you couldn't report a foreign country if you wanted to, because that's not in, it, in any of the drop-down lists. So it's got to be a U.S. entity. All right, some of you may have heard the term uh, option four filing or post-departure filing. Uh, option four is actually the obsolete uh, reference to it. it uh, the actual definition now is post-departure filing. What it is is uh, the Census Bureau has given some uh, shippers, some US PPIs, the authority to file late, up to five calendar days after the date of export. And uh, why they do that, I'm not necessarily sure. For some reason, uh, they have to uh, state uh, and present evidence that it is a hardship to them to be able to file pre-departure uh, because of their business model. Uh, now, why that is, I don't know, but, but uh, the Census Bureau recognizes that that, that circumstances exist. So they have allowed certain companies to file post-departure. It's not just anybody can do it. You have to be approved to do this. And currently there's a moratorium on, on issuing uh, post-departure filing status to uh, US, US PPIs. 
and there's no need to update your uh, airway bill or uh, bill of lading with the ITN when your customer gets it. Uh, all you have to do is put the uh, post-departure filing citation on your uh, airway bill or bill of lading, and away it goes. Uh, license value. This is something that often uh, trips up a lot of people in our company when they're handling a license. Uh, the license value is not the value of the license. It is the value of the material in the shipment that is moving under the license. Uh, so it, uh, it excludes anything other than overhead, which is insurance, domestic freight, or other charges from the value of the shipment. Uh, so I think uh, some of you that are handling licensed shipments, in particular is, uh, uh, material going to SD Aerospace, where just about everything is licensed. You're familiar with the two fields that you have to fill in there, uh, license value and shipment value. Uh, we already know the license value because we have, we have a copy of the license and we look at it and we see what's, what's on the license. What we don't know and what Census wants to know and what the BIS or the licensing agency wants to know is what amount of material was shipped against that license. Because whatever amount you put in that license value field is decremented or credited or charged against that license and they keep a running total of the shipments against that license. So that's why it's very important that you enter the correct value in the license value field for a licensed shipment. Uh, okay, now this kind of goes into the uh, defini definition of shipment value and some of you may have uh, been corrected by some of your customers as to what value to report for the shipment value. Uh, per the regulations, the, the definite, definition of shipment value is the uh, value of the material at the port of export. So that would include inland freight or any other charges necessary to bring the shipment to the port of export. Uh, that, you know, some of the more savvy customers are aware of this section in the regulations. I would say most of them are not. But just be aware that uh, if your customer asks you to include the inland freight or other charges necessary to bring the shipment to the port of export, that is a valid request. Okay, this is just an example of uh, license value here. Uh, licenses issued in the amount of $1,000. Material in the shipment includes only $100 of licensed commodity. You enter $100 as the license value and $100 plus any other charges necessary to the bring the shipment to the port of export as the shipment value. Finally, license value never should exceed the shipment value. If it does, it's wrong because what you're doing is you're, you're reporting the value that's stated on the license, and that's not what you're supposed to do. Uh, it's less likely to be misunderstood if you think of it as a licensed value, value of material that's in uh, being uh, exported that is licensed. Uh, it's only required for shipments moving under a BAS license, State Department license, or a Kimberley process certificate. Red flags. What are red flags, you may ask? Well, red flags are something that you need to watch out for when you're doing your jobs. Specifically, what is a red, red flag? Well, it's uh, something that uh, doesn't make sense, doesn't seem right, maybe seems illegal. Uh, seems contrary to what you should be doing. It's something that maybe your customer is asking, or maybe a salesperson in our company is asking you to do. And uh, you're thinking, eh, this, this is not what I do for other uh, shipments, so I'm not so sure I should be doing it for this one. Now, more specifically, if you look on that uh, chart there, which you should have displayed in your own office in three separate locations, uh, in your conference room, in your operations area, and in your warehouse, per our quality management system, that defines more specifically what a potential red flag may be. 
And some of the items listed on that chart are uh, products to be exported but not fit the buyer's line of business. Uh, items ordered is uh, incompatible with the technical level of the country to which, to which it is being shipped, such as semiconductor equipment to a country that has no electronics industry. Uh, customer not found in any internet search. Uh, freight forwarder is listed as the product's final destination. Customer is unfamiliar with the product's performance characteristics. And customer is paying cash for an item that normally would be financed. Now, what is supposed to happen when you, when you see a red flag is that the uh, light should go on in your head and say, hmm. I think I need to stop and figure out what I should be doing here. Maybe I'm making a mistake if I proceed with this ship. So let's try to get more specific here with some of the real life examples that have <laughs> happened in our company. To give you a better concept of what, what this is. <clears throat> okay, shipment uh, being handled by our office in San Francisco. Uh, below email is self-explanatory. I, I have a shipper who does not want anything to do with the merchandise that she is shipping. She argued she is not responsible. They bought it from her. She doesn't own it. Not her responsibility. <laughs> I get this type of shipper from time to time, but she is one of the worst. So you ever handle one of those customers? <laughs> Good. All right, so... Red flag should go up. Not good. All right, now this is a composite of the commercial invoice for that shipment to which uh, Harumi Ishii was referring. And you'll see here, there's a lot of strange things on here. There's uh, four different, uh, well, three different entities listed on here on the commercial invoice. That's kind of strange. Why would that be? Uh, now, this is the commodity description of the material that's being shipped. Yeah, clear as mud, right? <clears throat> so I punched that into almighty oh, Google to uh, <laughs> figure out what that is. And this is what I got. Uh, it appears to be some type of uh, electronic device used to enhance the capability of a rifle scope. Hmm. Sounds kind of menacing. So I checked with the uh, response team at the State Department about this, and according to what they said was, this appears to be uh, firearms accessories, and you need a license to export. Well, uh, ultimately what happened was uh, the shipment was seized by customs because uh, nobody wanted to give us a license. <coughs> And we kept all getting calls on this from uh, somewhere in the Middle East, uh, asking about when we were going to send it out. And really kind of a scary situation. So that one, that was good. The light, the light went on. Had a good uh, outcome for that one. All right, here's another one. Uh, this email was sent originally to our office in Detroit. Uh, totally unsolicited here. Uh, came in from uh, Dubai uh, asking us to arrange a shipment of fuel cells uh, going to Dubai. And they want, uh, uh, want to know, you know if we can handle it. So then uh, Victor in Detroit had sent this, had sent this to me. And he said, and I, he asked for my opinion you know, as to what he should do. I said, well, none of the parties listed was, was prohibited, which is good. But I just told them to refer them to our office in Dubai so that they could uh, validate their credentials. Well, I don't know if that happened or not, but uh, ultimately we decided to refuse to handle this business for, for the following reasons here. Uh, the phone number that was on the commercial invoice was a cell phone number that didn't seem to belong to the person that was displayed on the invoice. And the person uh, that, that who answered the call when we called this number didn't know anything about this shipment. And then the address of the uh, shipper displayed on the commercial invoice was this public storage unit. So that looked kind of
kind of suspicious. So we ultimately, uh, and this, <laughs> this ultimately worked its way to Los Angeles. I don't know how we started out in Detroit and then Los Angeles got involved, but uh, we told them don't handle it because uh, it's just, it uh, doesn't look good. Too many red flags surrounding this one. Light went on on that one. That's, that's good. That's what's supposed to happen. All right, now, uh, Hiromi Ishii brings me up again and says uh, uh, she's, she's gotten an inquiry from uh, somebody in Kintetsu, Japan about issuing two separate airway bills for a shipment. Uh, and this is what uh, this Ken Sataki is proposing here. So uh, Hiromi says that uh, she told them no because uh, we sh wanted to show somebody in Singapore for a sh for a airway bill that was issued going to Japan. So that didn't make sense. Uh, so my uh, position on this, she wanted my advice. I said, well, what? based on the way I was reading the uh, request from Ken Sataki was that he was asking us to issue multiple versions of the same airway bill. Uh, and I think uh, you know, common sense would tell you that that's not something we can do. You can only have one version of an airway bill. So, and check that one. so that was good. Uh, okay, another one here out of Los Angeles. Uh, got an inquiry uh, from somebody there uh, asking to arrange a shipment to Iran. All right, now right there. <laughs> hey, red flag should go up Iran, right? I don't think I have to tell you why. You're uh, following uh, the news in Twitter and uh, Instagram and uh, your Facebook page. You know that there's a lot of hostility between our country and Iran. So they want a, a customer wants to arrange a shipment to Iran under a general license that's in the regulations from OFAC. <clears throat> well, okay, that's legit. There's a general license that's out there. But the problem with this shipment was that according to the information provided here, uh, the ECCN assigned to this material was 1C991. Well, according to the regulations, uh, okay, well, let me back up here. Okay, uh, on this commercial invoice for this shipment, freight forwarders expediters. Okay, so uh, we're not expediters, okay? Just Bantam, Bantam bought us out of here. Uh, okay, we're not expediters, so, so maybe they hadn't had a chance to update their invoice or something. I don't know. But the primary problem with this is that uh, because the ECCN is 1C991, we cannot use this general license. The shipper has to apply for a specific license from OFAC. So we would get in a heap of trouble if we handle this under this general license. Not good. Sometimes uh, when we see the red flag, the light doesn't go on. It's good. <coughs> light shatters. I'll show you what happened here. Okay, this was uh, an ocean shipment that was handled by our uh, Newark office. Some of you may remember that once upon a time we had a, an ocean office. In, uh, in Newark. Well, no longer, but maybe this one may be one reason why we don't. <laughs> uh, they handled this uh, shipment here going to National Precision Machinery Import Export in China. And uh, when it came time to uh, creating the bill of lading, they noticed that the uh, consignee was not in the customer profile. So what do they do? Well, they did what they're supposed to do, is they created, uh, they, they signed the, uh, the general port code for the consummate. Okay, well, that's, that's okay. Well, what should have happened was, uh, it was a new customer. They knew that because it wasn't a UFS, it was a new customer. So what they should have done was screened it against 
the prohibited parties list to determine if there was uh, a valid transaction. Uh, about a year later, after we arranged this shipment, uh, one Adam Roth came calling about this shipment. He is uh, from the Office of Export Enforcement at the uh, Department of Commerce. And he came calling about this shipment going to this uh, entity in China. The problem was that uh, this company was a specially designated national uh, for supplying Iran with missile-related dual-use items. And that's not good. We shouldn't be doing business with people like that. So ultimately what happened was we reached a settlement agreement uh, with the BIS. Uh, notice it was a settlement. We weren't uh, officially charged with anything. Uh, we had to pay $30,000 to the BIS to, to uh, make them go away. <clears throat> Uh, there's a copy of the check that we issued. Now, uh, when I said go away, maybe that wasn't exactly right here because if you go to the BIS websites at this location here, you will see our company and a link to our company. If you click on that link, you'll see all the uh, gory details about this case. Uh, and s some of you may be aware that uh, sometimes we get inquiries from our customers about this or potential customers, new potential customers, asking us about this and asking, well, uh, what happened here and what did you do to uh, prevent it from happening again? So whenever you get those types of uh, inquiries, it's best that you yourself not uh, respond. Instead, send them to uh, me, send them to our department and we will uh, issue a response. Okay. This is a uh, list of people that we should not be doing business with, like that party in China for that shipment handled by our Newark office. Uh, these are uh, collect collectively referred to as uh, prohibited parties. Other people refer to them as restricted parties, denied parties, uh, sanctioned parties, blacklisted parties. Uh, in short, it's just uh, people we shouldn't be doing business with because our federal government uh, compiles lists, various lists of people that uh, they suspect are uh, criminals or are convicted criminals or suspected criminals or people that uh, work uh, uh, against our national interest or oppose the interests of our allies. And uh, we should not be doing business with them because it's illegal. And uh, these are who, who these people are, suspected drug traffickers, ter terrorists, money launderers, people who are suspected of uh, distributing weapons of mass destruction, uh, previous violators of export regulations, violators of human rights. Uh, it's, it's, it's something you always have to be aware of. You have to keep it in the back of your mind. Uh, and the problem with doing business with these types of entities is as the government views it as we are an accomplice to their actions. Uh, we are aiding, abetting in a violation, which is uh, not good. <clears throat> so what you should be doing to keep on guard from, from doing business for, with these bad guys is uh, I encourage you to be uh, uh, screening for new customers that you start begin handling, either a shipper or consignee, screening them against prohibited parties list. Uh, you should be aware especially of, of uh, shipments that are going to the Middle East or Africa, or Central Asia, or to a country that has hostile or tense relations with the United States, such as China, Russia, Pakistan. Libya, Venezuela is a hot one now. Uh, parties involved in a shipment that raise a red flag. And some of you are familiar with this uh, screening device that we have on our internet. You just type in the information about the, uh, the customer in question. This can be either used for either a shipper or a consignee, it doesn't matter. You, t you fill this in. And then you uh, press this button, and what happens uh, is that that sends an email to our departments. 
uh, with the information that you typed into this form. And then we take this information and then we compare it against the uh, prohibited parties list to see if there's a match. Uh, now you can do this yourself if you want to. Uh, there's a uh, section on our uh, intranet on the export compliance program where you can uh, screen for yourself, uh, for prohibited parties yourself, especially uh, on the weekend when we may not be available or late at night. You can check this. Uh, okay, there's <laughs> it's another instance of uh, when the light didn't go on here. Uh, we got one of these uh, prohibited party requests from uh, the Boston office, submitted by Patty Egan, uh, asking us to check on Huawei International. So uh, if you have been keeping up with the news, you would understand uh, our concern about handling business from Huawei. All right. So now notice this is Huawei International, not Huawei Technology. But still, I mean, it has Huawei in the name, so, you know, the red flag should go up. All right, so I get this, and I tell her, do not release this shipment from your warehouse. This is not good, and I, I told her this because I needed to validate with the BIS if this was indeed the same company. And at this time, when this request came in, uh, Huawei was not placed on any restricted party list. So I wanted to validate with the BIS exactly what their status was. So that's why I told her to hold it, hold off on it, and let me contact them. Well, she said they already sent it out, and uh, what happened was the, uh, it was on a letter of credit, and uh, they were being asked by somebody somewhere in Hong Kong to change the airway bill after the shipment had already been sent out to display Huawei on it. And uh, another, pro <laughs> another big problem with this shipment was it was licensed. And nowhere on this license do you see Huawei displayed. So if you know it was sent out on a license and somebody is asking you to change the airway bill to show somebody that's not on the license, why would you do it? It makes no sense. Huawei, for those of you who may not be familiar, it's Huawei Technologies, largest manufacturer of telecommunications company, uh, telecommunications, telecommunications equipment in the world. Second largest manufacturer of smartphones. Uh, they are a, uh, going to be a big player in the development of 5G networks, uh, which you probably have heard of. And we are trying to dissuade our allies from using them to build out their 5G networks because we are afraid of uh, potential surveillance of, of those networks uh, by Huawei, and then they're sending that information that they collect on the networks to the Chinese government. Uh, also accused of stealing intellectual property from its uh, competitors. Now, they were just uh, in the news uh, last week because the Justice Department opened up another case against them for uh, stealing uh, more trade secrets uh, from six companies in the United States. So uh, the pressure is really mounting on this company. And uh, you need to be aware that uh, this is somebody, somebody you definitely don't want to be doing business with. Uh, be aware also of uh, embargo countries or countries of concern. The, the five ones you uh, see listed there, Cuba, Iran, North Korea, Syria, and Sudan. Uh, still, some of these are uh, uh, somewhat muddied status, but in general, uh, we should not be uh, sending freight there uh, unless we are sending it under a license. And then, believe it or not, it's not a comprehensive embargo. There are licenses available to send certain products to these countries, uh, chiefly for humanitarian purposes, uh, medical equipment, agricultural products, things of that nature. Uh, okay, they already uh, require a license. Uh, okay, there's exemptions, which you probably never see. 
Uh, okay, now, uh, what a lot of people think they can do, and they're grossly mistaken, is that uh, if they are handling uh, business to one of these prohibited countries, uh, they think they can send it to another country. They can transship it to, uh, you know, some, somewhere other than that prohibited country, and then have it be transshipped by somebody else. Well, you can't do that. That's illegal. Uh, and that's referred to in the regulations as diversion. Uh, you have to be aware of where you're sending freight. And if it's, if it's something that's ultimately going to go to one of those embargoed countries, you cannot allow it to proceed. <clears throat> now, be aware that we have available to us a marvelous device uh, in our toolkit that we can use to carry out our responsibilities. Uh, under the export regulations. Uh, what is this device, you may ask? Well, it is one uh, of simple in design, yet uh, extraordinary in its efficacy. Uh, it is but a mere word, uh, but it's not just any word. It is a word that can move mountains, that can change the course of humanity, that can set the world on fire if, and only if, we have the courage and conviction to use it. What is this word? <laughs> no. <laughs> Allow me, please, to demonstrate to you its proper application. Okay. This was a uh, email that I got from uh, Matthew in, uh, I'm not going to try to pronounce his last <laughs> name here, Matthew in JFK. I uh, got an email from uh, one of his customers, Stryker, saying that uh, the airway bells did not display the destination control statement on them. And uh, he, the customer is saying that uh, they wanted us to put that on there. Well. I informed Matthew that uh, the regulations had changed and that specifically the destination control statement had changed. Uh, and uh, effective uh, November 15th of 2016, we were no longer required to display the destination control statement on the airway bill or the bill of lading. Why you gotta be so mean? <laughs> well, Taylor thinks I'm being mean. <laughs> but to the contrary, I'm not. <laughs> Let me explain to you. As I said, this is, uh, came out in the Federal Register. What happened was there, were, there used to be two different destination control statements. One from the BIS, the Commerce Department, the other one in the regulations from the State Department. Two separate destination control statements. <clears throat> well, that confused a lot of people, apparently, because some people didn't know which one they were supposed to use. Well, uh, so that was one reason they, uh, they got rid of both of them, and they, they kind of made a new one, and they consolidated uh, a little bit from each uh, agency. They made one. So that was uh, one reason. Uh, now, this is the previous destination control statement that was uh, made obsolete by the new regulation. Now, I don't know about you, but I still see this on, on documents issued by our customers now. Uh, I mean, <laughs> they're still putting this on there, and they need to know it's, it's, it's yesterday's newspaper and last week's trash. <laughs> it's no longer required. Throw it out. Get rid of it. It's been uh, almost four years now. Now, it says in the regulations that the destination control statement for items that are on the CCL or the USML, in other words, licensed items, more than likely, by the Commerce Department or the State Department, destination control statement should be on the commercial invoice. It is no longer required to be on the airway bill or the bill of lading. All right, so uh, one uh, Pamela Dorsett uh, persists 
<clears throat> he says, well, yeah, I know. I know the regulation changed. I know the distance control statement changed. I know you're not supposed to put it on the UN bill. But, well, we got a problem with uh, the way we do business. And we're not able to put the destination control statement on our commercial invoice. It's because it's issued by a foreign party. Uh, so uh, we're wondering, can, can you put the destination control statement on, on your airway bill, which uh, the regulations say is not required uh, because we can't put it on our commercial invoice, which the regulations say is required. So I ask you, do two wrongs make a right? <laughs> Class, <laughs> do two wrongs make a right? No, no they don't. <laughs> so why do it? <laughs> say, so what do you want? Get out of here. <laughs> Wake up. <clears throat> All right, anti-boycott law. Get hip to those. Uh, encourage to uh, prohibit, uh, to discourage or prohibit U.S. citizens from participating in boycotts of other nations. So you'll, occasionally you'll see this type of request where a uh, customer, it's, uh, a lot of times it comes from uh, overseas, uh, in Middle East countries, where they say, uh, we don't want you to include any material in the shipment that was uh, uh, made in Israel. Things like that. Uh, and the problem with those types of requests is that they're illegal because they are uh, they work against the national objectives of our country. They oppose the interests of our allies. And that's why we should not be uh, acquiescing to those types of requests. Uh, sometimes you'll see it in a letter of credit uh, some of these things you're probably not uh, privy to, but uh, sometimes you'll see it in uh, SOPs that are issued by somebody, a salesman who uh, doesn't know what he's doing, or somebody uh, in a, one of our agents in a foreign country who is not familiar with our laws. Uh, we kind of got in trouble, <laughs> well, we did, actually we did get in trouble with some uh, business going to Kaust from McMaster Car Supply uh, out of the Chicago area where uh, we were being asked, uh, we were, uh, Kaust was wanting us to, to review the commercial invoice issued by McMaster Car to make sure there were no items in there that originated from Israel. Well, that's illegal according to the uh, anti-boycott uh, laws. So, uh, unfortunately, uh, our personnel in uh, Chicago uh, were unfamiliar with that uh, regulation, but uh, McMaster Car was, so uh, it didn't make us look too good. And ever since then, uh, they've decided that uh, they don't want to do business with us because it's too much of a risk for them. So see, that's what happens sometimes when, when you don't understand the regulations and, uh, but your customer does and uh, well, uh, sometimes it costs you. <clears throat> now this was the uh, uh, SOP in question here where they were saying uh, we were supposed to be checking for items on the invoice uh, that originated from uh, Israel. Uh, whenever we get these types of uh, requests, we're supposed to report it to the BIS uh, one of our competitors, C.H. Robinson, uh, had agreed to pay $37,000 settlement to the BIS for furnishing information about uh, business relationships uh, other than itself with other uh, boycotted countries. Uh, this was a section of the settlement agreement they had there, and this is uh, what they did here. Uh, you're not supposed to do this. The, the problem was you, you are uh, certifying the status of another entity. You can talk about the relationship that you have, or Kintetsu has, with other entities, but you cannot certify the relationship with other entities to third parties. That's what gets you into trouble. So you gotta say no to that.
All right, this one, uh, probably one of the most psychotic things I've ever seen uh, since uh, being in this uh, business here. Uh, business from uh, Millipore Signal, EMD, uh, Millipore, whatever name they choose to go by, uh, had arranged a shipment that we arranged for on their behalf going to Taiwan. Well, there was a problem uh, with the uh, import clearance in Taiwan. Uh, the, the Taiwanese customs wanted us to validate the uh, value that was displayed on the commercial invoice. And they wanted us to do that by uh, providing them with uh, some type of form that we, they wanted us to fill out that displayed the value and then have that form uh, stamped by U.S. Customs. And this was the form that they wanted us to use. Uh, I mean, I don't know where it, they come from Taiwan. Who knows? I don't know. So uh, I told them to forget it. We're not going to do it because they should understand this type of a request is not only dumb, it's illegal. And I will explain why it's illegal if we go on here. Well, uh, the dutiful Scott Harmer in our Seattle office, and I can talk about him because uh, he's no longer with us. Uh, now, what, what was even more absurd about this was that EMD was the one who did the filing on this. So what uh, Scott was proposing is that we take a copy of the filing in AES. Uh, that was done by EMD and take it to customs and ask them to, to stamp it or sign it and say that, uh, you know, that the information on there was, was valid. Uh, so, uh, you know, I said, well, that's dumb too. I said, uh, what are you going to say to customs when they ask you, why do you want us to sign this form? And then you're going to tell them, well, I'm going to give it to uh, Taiwanese customs. Well, you are, huh? Okay. <laughs> well, uh, that's illegal. You can't do that. You can't, you can't give records in AES to a foreign party. The EEI is confidential. It can be used for, for official purposes. And what are official purposes? Well, let's jump on the Wayback Machine again to, to the beginning of our uh, presentation here. These are the official purposes of, the, of AES records. Yeah, I mean, you know. It's got nothing to do with uh, uh, establishing the value for foreign customs entities. Uh, so, right here, remember this, um, this comes up occasionally. It's not to be used by foreign entities or foreign governments for any purpose at all. A big no, I know. <clears throat> Okay, uh, Chicago, up in the batter's box again here. Uh, got a request from uh, the mighty Janine Yates uh, at Chicago saying uh, one of their customers was asking us to file an entry in AES for a truck shipment that went to Mexico. Uh, we didn't handle it. We did not handle the shipment. But uh, apparently, whoever did handle it uh, did not file the EEI and AES before it left the country, as they were supposed to. And uh, another problem with the shipment was uh, it was uh, authorized under a license. <clears throat> so the, uh, the request that we got from the shipper was uh, can we file the EEI and AES for this shipment? So uh, that would be a late filing, and plus it was uh, moving under a license. So uh, what do you think? Should we do that? No. No, that's right. You didn't. That's good. <laughs> You're not supposed to do it. No, we must refuse this request. Not do it. No. Oh. I mean, it's just common sense, right? Yeah. Okay. We close.
close by turning our attention to the uh, words captured for us in Proverbs chapter 19. Listen to advice and accept instruction, and in the end, you will be wise. So I ask you, how well did you listen? Who in this room can tell me three things, just three things that we've talked about, that I talked about in my presentation? Three things. Talked about a lot of things, I know. <laughs> <laughs> so it should be too hard to name three of them, right? Just three out of four. How many things did I talk about? A lot. Give me three. Yes, okay, good. Number one. What else? What else? <laughs> Keep going, all right. You've got the four now, all right? You got one. You got yeah, one. You can say no. You can say no. You can say no, yeah. But it's, it's fun to say no, right? I've demonstrated that, right? Uh, now, I mean, I know when you go into sales, that, that word no is stripped from your vocabulary, right? Well, actually, it can be provided to um, uh, U.S. government agencies, uh, U.S. government agencies, and it can be provided to the carrier, but it cannot be provided to foreign entities, but I will give you that because I think you have the uh, concept. So for you, you get red product. <laughs> <laughs> you coffee buzzes there in Starbucks. Coffee buzzes. <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.